Good morning. You may have noticed that communism, capitalism, and socialism are early industrial age systems. You may also have noticed we're no longer in the early industrial age. And we really haven't done much progress on economics, even though we've done a great deal of progress in technology, as was discussed yesterday. We know that uh, this may, the conditions are changing rather rapidly. Um, in capitalism, you have private ownership. In socialism, communism, you have state ownership. But who owns the internet? The means of production, Mr. Karl Marx, are you listening somewhere? <laughs> the means of production, before we talked about factories and things like that, but the means of production in the information economy, to a large degree, is the internet. So we've redistributed the means of production before people knew it was going to become the means of production. I know because in the 1980s I was helping put packet switching in the countries and they had no idea the implications. But today, wealth is increasingly concentrated around the world. Income gaps are widening. Employmentless economic growth seems to be the new norm. Return on investment is bigger on capital and technology than it is on labor. Future technologies can replace much of human labor as was been discussed yesterday and will probably be discussed some more. Long-term structural unemployment is a business as usual, surprise-free forecast. This is serious because if we have more than half the world unemployed, you have more than half the world in social chaos. That's the direction we're headed in unless we get a little smarter and we self-correct and we improve. So what do we do about this? We review, there's a lot of research going on around the world about the future work, but it tends to be short term. It's like five years or one industry or one country. It hasn't gone deeply into what are the tertiary consequences of economic change and cultural change around the world. So we got a bunch of questions together the Millennium Project, this global think tank. We got a bunch of questions together that we thought were either answered badly in the other research or not asked. And then we took all that information and we created some scenario drafts. We sent those around the world for people to review and think about. And now we're feeding those, those scenarios back for workshops. Uh, the first, one of the first workshops was actually done preliminarily here in Korea. Dr. Park Young Soo, want to stand up, raise your hand. She did one of the first ones. And there's been others in Germany and Israel and other countries around the world. And slowly we hope that they will then realize those workshops were, were a warm-up and we will do a bigger one. Hopefully, I know you've got some politics to handle, but when the politics settles down, maybe you can do another one. And then we'll take the results of all these and feed them back to everybody around the world to begin a conversation that's serious about the future of economics. The future of economics conversations, in my judgment, is not serious. Discussions about AI, discussions about aging, discussions about a lot of the things we've talked about today are beginning to be serious. But when it comes to economics, not serious. So, yesterday is a lot of discussion about AI, and I found there's an awful lot of confusion. Remember when AlphaGo won? You know, everybody got nervous. They said, oh my God, is the world's coming to an end. No, that was narrow AI, right? That's just the beginning. You don't have to get nervous yet. You can get nervous later, <laughs> but not yet. Then you have general AI that rewrites its own code and, and you know, goes for different things that Ben talked about yesterday. Artificial superintelligence, when it does its own purpose, when it redirects its own objectives, that's new. That does not, that's the thing that science fiction writers are writing about. That's the thing that Elon Musk and other people are trying to prevent some problems coming up with. That's different than the narrow. So the thing that beat the Go champion was not superintelligence, it was narrow intelligence. So we have some time to think as a species around the world, what are we going to do about this? So the idea of competing with AI and robotics is stupid. You're not going to win. <laughs> Give it up. Um, yes, there'll be some neo-Luddite re revolutions and things like that will occur probably. But also think about augmenting. How do we use all that stuff to augment us? This gentleman's got glasses. 
He's got telomeres, but also glasses. <laughs> now, he augments his eyesight so he sees better, right? It's not competition with the glasses. It makes you better. Think about artificial intelligence and robotics and the rest of these things as making you better, not replacing you, but making you into a new kind of capabilities. Now, the trouble is a lot of conversation, we, in the research that we did around the world, we noticed that I would say the weak point in the futurist community, in the AI community, was synthetic biology. I found the insights into synthetic biology to be the most naive. Synthetic biology, remember, it's not the old DNA where you take part out and the, the rose glows at nighttime. It's still a rose, it just glows. Okay? Synthetic biology is where you sit in front of a computer and you put together different molecular combinations and figure out how they can work out, and then you buy those materials and make a unique DNA chain that has never existed before in the world. That capability can change almost everything. Think of everything other life forms do, right? A leaf creates oxygen, separates out hydrogen. We don't know how to do that easily. <laughs> we have to use all kinds of energy systems. Nature does it without any heat. There's a lot of things that nature can do that we can learn from and duplicate. We haven't begun to get there. So, I use the phrase next technologies, or NT, to avoid sounding too long. <laughs> Because if we say artificial intelligence, robotics, synthetic biology, genomics, computational science, uh, cloud computing, big data analytics, artificial and augmented reality, nanotechnology, Internet of Things, Internet of Everything, Internet of Elder Bodies, synthetic web, quantum computing, telepresence, holographic communications, intelligence augmentation, collective intelligence, 3D, 4D printing materials and biology, drones, driverless cars, autonomous vehicles, conscious technology, and the synergies of all this too much. You know? So we'll just have, just like we said IT. What's IT? IT is a lot of stuff. <laughs> NT, because the reason I, I stress this is because we have focused so much on AI, we have forgotten synthetic biology. We've forgotten that the synergies of these things, that's what makes the big deal. And the synergies can be predicted, but they're not often. Think of the synergies of technologies in your cell phone. Camera, alarm clock, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's where we're going, is the synergy. So NT, in the scenarios, that's what we use. So here's, whoops, here's a simple one. This several years ago. It's the synergies of... Photovoltaics, robotics, satellites, drones, IT, AI, and genetic engineering, all in one little photograph. That's a lot of stuff integrated in one little thing. By the way, you'll notice there's no people in that photograph. And the production is better than with the people production systems. So global scenarios, one is complicated and mixed bag. That's where you take the trends and you project them out to 2050. That's still a lot of change, because if the acceleration of technology is accelerating, and the integration of technologies and synergies is going on, and the globalization of things is going on, that means a whole lot of change by 2050, but that's business as usual projection. That's where you have good decisions and bad decisions, like today. The political economic turmoil, future despair, is that's where we don't make the good decisions, world does go into turmoil, and we don't want to be there. <laughs> the third one, is if humans were free, self-actualizing economy. What happens if civilization makes the means of shelter, clothing, the basic necessities, education, health, all the rest of that sort of stuff, it's there. And if that's being done mostly by NT, then what do we do? According to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, after your basic needs are satisfied, you, you look for self, love and belongingness. Well, that's what we do with social networks, right? You're getting love and belongingness being taken care of. But then the next step is self-actualization. Who are you? What is your gift to the world? And around the world, who needs that gift of you? You'll be able to connect with AI avatars to have go around the world, get, connect you up, so you make a living out of being yourself. That's unique. We've never had that capability before. You know, what we now will have it as a necessity because that's your competitive advantage is you being yourself. But if you think you're going to make a living in a specific profession for the next 30 to 50 years, good luck. <laughs> good luck. 
Now, these are some quick assumptions. We divide up the people into employed means you go somewhere for a job. So in scenario one, you still have two billion people doing that. Even in this, the, the scenario three, you still have one billion people. The idea is how many people do you need to make civilization work? We figure you need at least a billion, right? This is 2050. Workforce is six billion. However, if the telomere conversation and the other ones come to four, the workforce will be bigger than six million. So I'm willing to bet it will be, but I'm not saying that on the record yet. <laughs> this is just assumptions, all right? But you'll see here self-employed increasing. In my country, it's around 17%, 12 to 17% already. All right? and, we, and the necessity of doing that hasn't hit yet. But over here in scenario three, you hit three billion. So that's a big deal, which means that uh, you, you have four billion people employed and in the beginning of the year 2000, we only had about 3 billion. So, yes, we can create more work and more activities. That's true in both of these scenarios. But it's what you're doing. What you're doing that's, is important. The informal economy means you're not paying taxes. <laughs> you know, your, your small activities and so forth. And it's really hard to move the informal economy. Take Egypt. 60 or so percent is the informal economy. Much of the developing world is the informal economy. It's hard to move that over. It'll, it'll move, but it may not move as much as we would like. Scenario two, you get to two billion because of social chaos. People have to go out of the system. Um, this gives you a little content of it. Uh, I'm, I'll read, uh, maybe the translator in Korean can, can go, go through that quickly. For those in English, scenario one, you're, you end up with a world of giant corporations that grow beyond government power. That's a trend forecast. It's not a surprise, it's a trend forecast. Look at how religion organized people to begin with, and then state power grew on top of religion. You still have religion, but it grew on top. Remember Napoleon? He took the, the crown out of the religious leader's hands, stuck it on his own head. That was that transition. Now we're in the transition between, let's say, China and Google and Facebook, and a little conflict going on. We're moving beyond that sort of stuff in this scenario, but it's good and bad decisions. Scenario two, you've got problems of decentralization, chaotic situation, new combinations of governments, but an awful lot of militias, terrorism, and organized crime. One of the key variables in this, these scenarios is how well we manage a global strategy to counter organized crime, because the techniques, technologies, and powers of NT can be good, and it can be the greatest boom for organized crime. Organized crime makes twice as much money of all the military budgets combined. Add up the military budgets, it's about 1.5 trillion. Add up organized crime, it's about 3 trillion. You throw an NT into that mix, and you can imagine organized crime can do anything. So that's a big variable, we've got to deal with that. Okay. Uh, oh, let me go back here for a second. Oop, I guess I didn't go the right way. There we go. If, if people were free, how are they going to be free? If the, as we use NT, the cost of objects and services will eventually bell curve and go down, just as they have with a lot of computer capabilities. We all say, we'll wait till the price comes down, right? We take that for granted. That's not the case with education yet completely, but it will be. It's not the case with health and medicine yet, but it will be. So eventually, the cost of living starts to fall. We figure 20, 25, 20, 30 or so. Also, the income that you can get from taxing robots, all kinds of different capabilities, we tax cars, right? It's an income to the state to pay for roads. We do the same thing for the new technologies. Tremendous capability of creating new sources, but there's not that much yet. So as that income goes up and the cost of living goes down, it eventually crosses over. We figure maybe 2030. Also, if general, <laughs> general intelligence comes in, we're going to need it because we're going to hit a lot of unemployment fast. That gives enough money, eventually, to have a basic universal income. Right now, it's not cost effective. I have talked to several governments, even in Finland twice, <laughs> who are doing it next year, an experimental run. No one has given me a cash flow projection. And we should not make a political decision on this until you can see a cash flow projection to show it's financially sustainable. 
otherwise we shouldn't do it. And we should better to wait a few years and to wait till it can work. Because when it can work, then that means you will have the freedom of not being a nervous wreck about getting a job. You'll have the freedom to think, who am I? You're not going to make a lot of money with this, but enough so that you're not thrown in the streets, okay? So you have time to think, time to explore who you are and how to connect with others around the world, time to experiment with this AI avatars that people have been talking about here, how you can use it to find activities for you. So then slowly you can make this transition, and then we have a self-actualizing economy. Now, this is one of the downsides. I don't know how you get around the problem of privacy. I just don't know. Because if you list all the technologies that can evade your privacy, and all the technologies that want to safeguard it, it looks to me that you lose. <laughs> now, one thing for us to think about, what would it mean if you were in a society that a lot of the things you could hide, you can't? It might, one of the consequences could be a more honest society. Those involved in the Cold War on either side know that their phones were not always secure. <laughs> so they had to be reasonable about what they said. They were sort of on the record, right? When you're off the record, you can say all these terrible things. But if you're always on the record, you're less likely to say all those terrible things. But that affects your brain. That affects how you are. Slowly over time, it might even make us a better civilization. Who knows? It's a consideration. Now, this is a silly photograph because obviously a robot doesn't pick up a book and read. My point here is that with this, all this discussions, well, will artificial intelligence create a soul, a consciousness, and so forth? That's fine, but it with, it, it is, it's diverting a serious conversation about what are we going to do about this as an economy, as a culture, as a society. These are the important questions. Because whether it's got a consciousness or not, it's going to act as if it does. Remember, birds fly, airplanes fly. They're not the same. <laughs> you know, AI learns, we learn. We're not the same. The important thing is what are the consequences, secondary consequences, tertiary consequences on government, politics, economics, culture, civilization, values. This is the important stuff. Now, in the studies that we reviewed around the world, there were very few that said, here's what you do about it. Almost all of them said things like, you're going to lose so many taxi cab drivers by this year, in five years. All right, that's interesting. It's the beginning of some thought. That's okay, not bad. But then they would turn around and say, well, therefore, we need more scientists, engineers, mathematicians, and so forth. Okay, that's a good idea right now. I agree. Do it. Good idea. Good. But not after 2030. <laughs> after 2030, we figure, no matter what profession you're in, you're never going to know enough. Not a chance. You walk into the university, you're automatically obsolete. So you're not obsolete if you get into a self-actualizing economy. So some policies are good to do for a period of time, but then you don't stick with them. All right? So this stuff is good for a while, for right now. But if we think that's the long-term solution, we don't understand what's coming up with NT. Scenario two, the despair. You've got political gridlock. I offer you my country. <laughs> I offer you your country, I offer you a lot of countries, right? Political gridlock can continue to increase. Um, you know, did it, well, anyway, I won't go into all the politics, that's your business, my business, different deal. But this political gridlock, the environmental stuff, the economic failed states, means an awful lot of migrations. When people migrate from point A to point B, if there are people living in point B, there's going to be conflict of some sort. We don't know what kind of conflict necessarily, but conflict. When you have the, the, the migrations that you're seeing now from uh, Middle East, North Africa, going into Europe is a tiny introduction of what happens in scenario two. We haven't hit the big stuff yet. We haven't even hit the, the climate change, the major climate change stuff. Failed states can ricochet. The population is accelerating, not accelerating, but the population is going up. The youth bulge, no employment, right? in those areas. That's going to be an awful lot of, of migrations coming up. We've got to stop that. Protectionist reaction. We're seeing this in my country. We're seeing this in Hungary. We're seeing it in different countries. We're seeing it in England. Uh, 3D, 4D printing gets rid of an awful lot of trade. 
Furthermore, if you do renewable energies, you're not going to have ships going across with oil. <laughs> so an awful lot of things that you do trade across the oceans, you can make locally. Financial systems cannot support the aging societies, as was pointed out yesterday. If we don't make the old people smart and healthy, we've got financial collapse. That's right. So here in this scenario, we're saying we didn't invest wisely. Remember the question yesterday was how many dollars you're going to have to do it? Well, let's do it. We don't. We got this problem. Scenario two. International science and technology organization is a collective intelligence on science and technology. It's going to work out for a lot of people, but it could become, in scenario two, a field for information warfare. Um, you're going to come out with some new product. I put in some information. Your product is terrible, and mine's going to be great next week. You don't sell any, and I make a lot. That's not nice. <laughs> so in, in this situation, manipulation of information, you no longer trust it. If you no longer trust your information flows, that's what we call paranoia. It's not biological paranoia with chemistry in the brain, but it's behavioral paranoia. You don't trust information flows. And that's a very unstable world. Uh, so governments didn't anticipate NT. They talked about silliness, like you saw in my country. It was rumor, well, she said this. No, he said that. Hey, this is little children. We got serious stuff. And if the politicians are not going to make these conversations serious, we as a people have to. It's too important to leave this to the politicians. Just like after World War II, the Rand Corporation was set up because it was said that war is too important in a nuclear age to leave to just the generals. I'm saying this transition is too important to leave to just the governments. So, here's your image of scenario two. All right? Now imagine this over much of the world. This is plausible, you know? This is plausible if we continue to be asleep, if we continue to talk about trivia. Think of how many words go through your brain each day that are irrelevant. How much junk information do we fill ourselves with? And then you see, imagine organized crime, terrorism, and corruption, synergies among these, running the decision-making system of the world, making democracies an illusion. This is plausible. Scenario three, self-actualization. Here, governments did anticipate. They did create rolling long-term strategies. You don't make one strategy and you don't ever change it. It's a rolling strategy. You keep reviewing it and reviewing it. Conducted research on how to phase in basic universal income. Don't rush into it. You've got time. Korea can study this for years. Better to study it and really know what you're doing. Take your time, do it right. Because then when you go into it, you've got a really a fabulous future. Um, promote innovation and self-employment. You're beginning to do that now a bit. We've got to do that more. Focus on education of increasing intelligence. We know the brain can be brighter than it was when it was born. We know this. We know an awful lot of things about how to augment us to be more intelligent as well as stimulate the brain to be more intelligent. The purpose of education right now around the world is give you knowledge and make you a nice citizen. Okay? It should have a third purpose. Increase your brain functioning by whatever means. Society is not getting less complex. The world is getting more complex. That's true. So we're going to have to be smarter. So we've got to study how to increase intelligence, creativity, civics, critical thinking, human relations, philosophy, ethics, and values. That's going to be important to be successful in the self-actualizing economy. Not a particular discipline. You'll still have some lawyers, you'll still have some doctors, but you won't have as many per capita. All right? So the idea of a profession will be less important than skills and knowing what you want to do and knowing what you're doing and how to connect to those people around the world. That becomes a skill set rather than a particular discipline. Artists, media, moguls, entertainers, they've got to get engaged in how to help the future culture change. Right now we define our value as our job. I am an engineer. I am a NGO executive, that's what I, my value is. Okay, that's our culture today. It doesn't matter whether you're in Latin America or Korea or China, it's the same. 
We have to because if those jobs will eventually start going away, and if we don't make the culture changes in movies and art and drama and so forth, if we don't make those culture changes, then we'll lose self-respect. And if we lose self-respect, then we become cyber heroin addicts of one form or another. And we lose, and, and we, we, and it's a bad idea. So we have to get the idea that we can now develop our self-respect not necessarily by our job, but by our self-actualization. I'm living a cool life doing this and that. And if we get so busy being cool, being ourself, I'm less interested in giving you a hard time. But if you and I are competing over the same contract, I'm going to elbow away and you're going to elbow away and somebody loses and I get some skin on my elbow. But if she's so interested in being herself, Fine, help yourself. I'm doing this cool thing over here. Let it go. Government as referee, participatory democratic supports national collective intelligence system. You're still, just like you still have religion helping to organize society a bit. And you still have governments doing the referee thing. Corporations grow beyond that. But individuals will grow beyond that with a self-actualizing economy. Personal avatars find markets, work, experiences, and self-actualization. Your personal avatar, you know, you teach you who you are, it's your friend. And if you have different personalities, you can have several avatars. <laughs> and then they go off at nighttime where you're sound asleep. Next morning they wake you up and they say, I found 75,000 things you'd like to do today. I know you can't do them all. So I've gone through your last decision-making processes and I see a trend starting to develop. You haven't specifically said this, but it seems like you're going to be interested in this. What do you, we don't try it out. And oh, there's other ones, there's five over here you can do and they'll earn you enough money that you can have another vacation off in Jeju Island down there and have a good time. Self-actualizing economy, the governments anticipate it, they, they do all these sort of things, they wake up and they make a very beautiful future. Scenario three. This is a actually a five-year-old photograph. It's an antique future here. Uh, this is a person who's making a living playing around in the world. What might that look like in 2050? It might look like this. And actually, this is already being experimented on now. It's just not, to my knowledge, up for personal cells yet. Maybe the military has probably got it for the CIA folks. I don't know. But anyway, the idea is that this will give you the interface for everything, for your virtual realities, your augmented realities, your, 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 your watts in 17.5 or whatever it turns out to be at this point. Um, and that gives you your augmented intelligence. Now, in Western philosophy, we're taught that philosophy came from the leisurely priestly caste of Egypt. They had the time to think. And out of that thinking, came a lot of what we call science, mathematics, and philosophy. What happens if you have more than half the people of the world as leisurely priestly cast and augmented geniuses? Here's two guys, you may recognize them, Steve Jobs and Bill Gates. How much of the world did they influence? Two guys. Obviously other people work with them, but two guys with the spearheads. These are two guys. What happens if by 2030 or 2050, you've got millions, if not billions of people like that? Imagine, like right now we say, we have an IQ test and we, we bell curve it, so the middle is 100 IQ, right? Well, if you have this little device on your eye, why wouldn't you get every answer right, all right? Why wouldn't everybody be behaviorally a genius? Now, of course, you can elect to be dumb, but I don't think that's a good idea. <laughs> okay, so we've done these workshops in a bunch of different countries. You can see over here, um, South Korea did its first one. We hope that some of you here will get together with Young Suk Park and maybe do a bigger one. This is something that's not just a one-shot deal. We've got to rethink and rethink and rethink. It's just like you hear about military strategies. Military strategies change a little bit over time with new technologies, right? New geopolitical situations, right? Well, we have to do the same thing with our economics. Some considerations for leaders. Education learning. Make increasing intelligence an objective of education. Period. Because that focuses research, 
teacher training schools start to learn how to do it, and so forth. In parallel to STEM, to use the STEM now, I'm not knocking that, but not long term, create self paced, inquiry based learning for self actualization. Not just for mastering a profession, but for mastering yourself. Begin the shift from mastering a profession to mastering a combination of skills. Increase focus on developing creativity, critical thinking, human relations, philosophy, entrepreneurship, self employment, ethics, and values. In government, produce alternative cash flow projections. We don't know the truth of the future. Believe me, I've tried to work it out for 40 years, and that's hard to do. <laughs> but we can know what are possibility alternatives. So we shouldn't have just one cash flow projection, we should have several based on population and de demographics, different assumptions, based upon how quickly NT grows, depend on how the cost of living comes down. Different assumptions, you should have three or four or five cash flow projections and make them available to the whole public so that we the people think this through. Work with other countries to establish an international science and technology organization and make it somehow vulnerable, less vulnerable to manipulation. The manipulation will be there but in the very beginning, we have to understand that people will want to manipulate it just like they manipulate anything else. But we've got to design it to begin with to avoid that, if possible. Create and implement a global organized crime strategy. As I said, if we don't do that, all that capability we're talking about will be used faster by organized crime than you probably will. Because remember, they got twice the, fun, the money of military budgets. Let that sink in. This is serious. Uh, add trans-institutional law to for-profit, non-profit. Trans-institution, you, you can have a trans-institution for increasing intelligence, you can have a trans-institution for beating AIDS, you can have a trans-institution for anything. Trans-institution is you have a board, the people who do the work, and where the money comes from and the value added to all the main institutional categories. You should have some from universities, but not a majority of any one, because universities can be academic. <laughs> You know, some from business, some from governments, some from NGOs, so that you take the strengths of self organizing people. Because if I hire you, I got to manage you. If you knock on my door, I don't have to manage you. I don't have to manage Young Su. Young Su, she's in motion. She's going she's to do stuff whether I tell her to do stuff or not. She's, gonna, she's in motion. So we have people who self organize like this. Because you can't have everybody in your business. Right? You want self-organize. Don't hire, self-organize. But then you take the strengths of each institutional category. That which universities do the best, they do. That which government does the best, it does. What business does the best, the same thing. But you're coordinating. So the business takes the strength of all the institutional capacities without the institutional liabilities. And that makes the Millennium Project so efficient. People evaluate us and they can't believe we do what we do because we're a trans institution. It doesn't exist legally. I mean, we, we exist legally, but as a nonprofit organization. We, there's no legal state or uh, legal personhood for a trans institution. By creating trans institutions, you'll, you'll improve the management of society. Management is a major part of making the future work right. <laughs> if you have bad management, the future doesn't work as well. So we need new management institutional systems. This is one of them. Science and technology, augment movement. We can invest into computer capabilities that augment you and we can invest into NT technologies that replace you. Those are judgments. Those are judgments. What are the likely impacts of AI, AGI, when and how? Let's continue to review this because some wise guy comes up with a new way of doing something tomorrow that I didn't think about and it changes the forecast. Could synthetic biology create more jobs than AI replaces? Interesting question. Scenario one, where the economic growth comes from, is from all these trillions of dollars that have been sitting off to the side, that haven't been invested because of insecurity since 2008, 2009. We're still insecure, right? And we're not helping this with the current politics of the United States and Korea and others, right? So we've got all this money, this tremendous amount of money in the world. The world is awash with money. But when synthetic biology becomes more reliable, that money in scenario one goes into here and the growth of synthetic biology products and activities grows like a big surprise, like the internet was a big surprise to a lot of people. 
create International Science and Technology Organization as an online system. Uh, it becomes very critical in a lot of scenarios. Culture, explore cultural transition to self-actualizing economy. Let's sit down and think about it. Now, for the record, I'm about to make a controversial thing, statement, that some people will now reject everything I've said. In the cultural revolution of the United States, in the 1960s, 70s, right? We had, you know, women's liberation, we've had uh, civil rights movements, we've had free, free inquiry, you know, love and power and, and all that, right? Big deal. How did it happen? It was driven by music. The answer, my friends, is blowing in the wind. Gets a Nobel Prize, folks. Right? He was driven by music. Wasn't driven by music. There was some. There were some movies, but not much. It was mostly music. Well, music had words. There was a guy named Timothy Leary. You may have heard about. <laughs> he was the guy that sat down with the songwriters. It was deliberate. It was not accident. He said, "We've got to get the culture to open up." and it's going to be the next generation. What does the next generation listen to? They listen to music. So therefore, you sit down and you get stoned with those great writers. That is the high-impact strategy for cultural change. So taking a page out of history, we've got to do the same thing, but it's got to be worldwide now. And we've got more art forms. We've got computer games we didn't have before. We've got all kinds of cultural ways. We've got to figure out how to explore to begin to get people to think. Because right now, we're all looking for that job. Looking for that job. Looking for that job. Or if we have that job, we're looking for that new contract, knocking the other guy out, right? That's where we are. So culture's gotta change. The arts, media, entertainment, computer games, arts, media alliance to create new social movements. We are one species. Remember the song, We Are the World? kind of stuff we're going to have to get more of. We are the world. We've got to start thinking this way because as we all know in a global system, you mess up over here, U.S. financial instruments, for example, in 2008, and the world has an impact. All right? China is a bigger deal now. China makes a mistake. It's going to be a bigger deal than it used to be in the past. We are one species, augment, augment rather than replace, self-actualization. Invest into what replaces you. Yesterday, I was giving another talk. I gave three talks, by the way, the last couple of days. Baku and, uh, Baku and where the hell was I this morning? Lima, Peru. Anyway, but not in person. But you know, I was talking to them about this. Is, is, is in Azerbaijan, they're a nervous wreck because they're dependent upon oil. Some other countries have oil and other things, but Azerbaijan and like Kuwait and sort of have oil, and that's mostly it. Oil price goes down, they're a nervous wreck. Right? Well, why don't you, re what, what's replacing you? Well, some of it is natural gas, some of it is renewables, some of it is en energy efficiencies. There's a lot of things. But the country of Azerbaijan and one's like, invest into those things. Invest into what replaces you. If, if, instead of like fighting like a neo-Luddite against something, can I invest into that? You know, and I'll take my return on investment and then I can sort of do my self-actualization economy while I'm making money over here. It's a different way of looking at things. New social contract between government and the government. This is giant coming up for two reasons. One is terrorism. When you have a terrorist group, you know, you can infiltrate, you can have satellite stuff, there's all kinds of stuff you can do. But when you have an individual terrorist, Acting alone, that's tough. But that ain't nothing compared to the future because that NT capability also goes to individuals. An individual acting alone will be able to make and deploy, without any permission of anybody, a weapon of mass destruction. That is a straight trend forecast. Now, there's a lot of work being done on that. I'm involved in it. You can see some of the stuff on our website and you can contact other people about that. We did some NATO meetings on this last month or whenever it was. But that's a new social contract. The old social contract was, I'll pay taxes and you make sure North Korea doesn't shoot me. Okay? That's the contract. Now, with this, 
the social contract means I am a citizen and I'm going to figure out if my neighbor is doing that. Now, that, can we do this without turning it into a Gestapo? I don't know. That's what we're working on. Because the front line on this is the individual living in a community. It's not going to be government systems. They can't do it. So we need a new social contract. I'll pay my taxes, yes. But I'll also figure out what's the new role for the public. What's, the role of the public had no role in the, in the Cold War. You paid taxes, but that was it. And you prayed. There wasn't a thermonuclear war with Russia, right? The Soviet Union, you prayed. But you had no power. In this situation, you do have power. The individual in the community is the front line on preventing single individuals massively destructive. We call CMAD. Now, but that's a new relationship with the government because we're part of security of the world. We're part. It's a new relationship to us to think about. The second part of the new social contract is the economic security. You, the government, figure out how you can make this transition and I will be a self-actualizing, good voting citizen and a good person, self-actualizing and so forth. So what's the new social contract? The old social contract was you pay your taxes and I'll make sure there's rules so you're not put in jail you know, for doing business, so to speak. We're going to have to have a new social contract. And we're not going to invent this tomorrow morning. It's going to take some time. We have to think about this. Business and labor, invest into Kickstarter. How are you going to redistribute some of the wealth? How do you prevent the concentration? We now have some means to do this. In this conference, you've got some pretty smart people who are inventing things. They might do it in their company, they might do it as an individual, and if they do, then you can invest into it. So Kickstarter, like democratization of venture capital. The whole world can be involved in venture capital. And if they do it halfway decently, then that redistributes the next round of wealth. Create personal AI avatars to support your self-employment. It's going to be hard for you to do it by yourself. I, didn't, I know. I've been trying to do it. I mean, more or less, I'm part of a self-actualizing economy myself. No one hired us to do the Millennium Project. You know, Ted Gordon, my co-founder, we just did it. We found markets around the world and we just did it. We just created it out of, out, out of pure invention. So more and more people can do that sort of stuff. But having an AI avatar would have made it easier for me. <laughs> I'd like to have had one. Workers' rights and self-employment. Labor unions around the world have worked hard to give honest relationships between the employer and the employee. If you're self-employed, will there be new problems about workers' rights, about the self-employed? We don't know. Got to think about this. Individual augmented genius apps. If you're a business person, think about an app for augmenting genius, and you'll do quite well. <laughs> international collaboration, again, to create the International Science and Technology Organization, and business schools should teach synergetic intelligence, synergetic advantage, and synergy, as well as competitive intelligence, competitive advantage, and competitive strategy. Right? Now, this is not co-opetition. Co-opetition is where we compete and cooperate two different companies at the same time. That's happening, right? Any serious business knows this. Synergetic intelligence is what's a new relationship that doesn't exist yet, and we create a whole new relationship here for a whole new kind of market and new activity. We don't teach synergetic intelligence in business schools. And if there is a business school out there that does, I want to know about it. I haven't heard about it yet but we're going to have to learn how to do synergy as well as competition. Because as the means of production, the means of empowerment get better, the ability for me to elbow you gets rougher and rougher and rougher. And I'm not sure I want to live in that world. <laughs> but those same means give me the ability to seek synergies with you that I didn't have before. Quality versus productivity. The idea of always pushing growth and productivity leads us to the environmental catastrophe we have today. Any further questions? <laughs> right. So let's talk about qualitivity, not just productivity. What is qualitivity? Should we teach qualitivity in business schools? What is quality? How do I improve the quality of something? As I said before, you only need so many people to make civilization work. 
but you need many people to make the quality of civilization worthwhile. Memes and advertisements to create the cultural transition. You can't sell a product without advertising it with some value next to it. You're selling, you know, power or fame or sex or something, and that's how you sell your product. You use it. Well, we could also throw in those new kinds of values in there, so slowly we warm up people into the cultural change that's necessary. Billionaires are beginning to get organized because they realize that as wealth concentrates, the development gap gets wider, their heads will roll, they'll be cut off. History is very clear. History is very clear. And they're smart, right? They didn't get to be billionaires for the, by being stupid. So they read history, they know they have to change. So now there's billionaire clubs are starting to get together. So imagine that the, the big wealth over here and the mass poverty down here, you just got to be connected up. And that's their job, to do that, to save their butts. Um, global cyber game, we all know that games are participated in more than people read books. You know, as a writer, I find this annoying, <laughs> but I have to look at reality. So another way of changing culture is changing the computer games. How can computer games help you explore not only how I blow your brain out, can I also create a, explore how I get successful and get all kinds of new credits and new fame and new activities through being self-actualization? Big challenge. New roles for labor unions, the augment movement, they should be pushing the augment movement rather than the replacement movement. The idea with a, a new technology database is that labor unions, instead of trying to keep your job, they'll try to keep your income. Because if they try to argue to keep their job, they're going to lose, as labor unions are losing. They can win and have new capabilities to say, if you're a business, I might say to you, what are the next things that need to be invented? What are the next things, next skills, and so forth? And then I so see over here which ones are going to be laid off first. So those people are going to be laid off first, get the opportunity to get the training for the new capabilities that these people say is going to be necessary. So the labor unions can help the transition rather than fighting it. You can get all this stuff in the state of the future. Um, I would actually like you to get instead this. I understand that people still want to have books in their hands. Um, but this is a collective intelligence system. This is a collective intelligence system anybody can get access to. It's a subscription service, but we also have free access to some of it. And all the stuff I've been talking about and other stuff is in here. And it gives you the ability to participate. Every piece of information in this system, at the bottom right-hand corner, has a little comment icon. You click that on and you say, you know, that's a cool idea, but in Azerbaijan, we solve the problem this way. There's the web link. Now everybody gets a collective intelligence from that person. You hit comment on the top, you get all the comments on each piece of information. Collective intelligence is when you integrate human brains, software, and information such that every element of each other can change each other all the time. So it's evolving thing. So collective intelligence isn't a thing, it's an emergent property. And that's what we need for the world. This is a trial one. It's just made the most progress so far. Google will wipe us out any time they want to. <laughs> but this is where it is at this point, and you can take a look at that stuff. Um, the Millennium Project is a global participatory think tank. Um, it may be the first globalization of a think tank. Uh, a lot of times you hear somebody say, well, we have a global think tank too. We're at Harvard. We have one guy from India and one guy from China. And we're a global think tank. The guy in India and China got the PhD at MIT. It's not necessarily a global think tank. Here at the global think tank, ideas you leave people where they are and you pick the brains. So I can send out a note. Who knows the most about energy? It goes to Dr. Park Young Suk and to the other 59 node chairs. And their team picked who knows the most in business, who knows the most in government, who knows the most in NGOs, who knows the most in universities. So it's a global brain picking system. And then we take the information and we give them back to everybody. Then Dr. Park takes it, puts it into Korean, changes what she likes, and then sells it. <laughs> All right? That's okay. So you get the benefit of the whole world into those books. It's not just a Korean study. Right? We have nodes in Tehran, Iran, and in Tel Aviv, Israel. 
The idea is this is a think tank on behalf of human beings. It's not a think tank on behalf of a country, an ideology, or a single issue. We, the human species, need to think together in an organized way. And that's what this is. This is now, people will do a better job in the future, but this is where we are so far. So there's some sources where you can follow up and get what you want out of this. I wish you a happy, successful future. And as they say in IBM, think. <laughs> We've got to think more than we have before and collaborate. So I hope you'll work with Dr. Park to get a serious workshop on the future of work and technology. This is serious stuff. It's not going to be solved by one government or one university or one brain. It's got to be all of us thinking together. It's a big deal. Thank you very much.